Welcome everybody. Welcome everybody. Good to see you all. We're going to talk about some apartment permaculture. I hope you're all having a good night. I uh, hope you had a good summer. Um, going to start off. My name is Charles Williams. I teach with Earth Activist Training. Uh, we're recording tonight's session. And so uh, it'll be available to you all afterwards. Uh, we'll post a link. We'll send it out to you. So it's on. Um, and if you don't want to be seen, you might want to keep the camera off. But you can have your camera on. It's up to you. You can wave. Hi, everybody. Um, so that's going to help tonight. Uh, I'm a lead instructor with Earth Activist Training. Uh, my specialty uh, traditionally has been a broad acre permaculture, forest and ag lands and grazing systems and you know, large properties. But I've had lots of people come over to my place. Like, oh, you should talk about living in an apartment because I live in a small apartment on the first store story of a building here in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, also known as Mi'kma'ki. And uh, yeah, so I just want to talk about what it's to, to live in an apartment and how do you apply permaculture. So I'm going to talk kind of wide ranging and I'll do a little presentation at the beginning. And then uh, at the end, we'll have some time for questions and conversation. So with that, I'm going to get on to my PowerPoint. And hopefully it all works out good. Okay, here we go. Can everybody see that? It should say apartment permaculture. I got some knots. Okay, I'm going to see if you can see it. Awesome. So while I'm presenting, it's hard for me to read the chat at the same time. But if you have questions, feel free to toss them in the chat. Um, so we don't lose them, uh, and we'll come back to the chat uh, at the end. People are saying that the audio is a little bit distorted. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, let me see if I can make that better. How's that? Any better? Worse, better. Uh, got some in the chat. Better. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for letting me know. Okay, so apartment permaculture. First off, I would just want to acknowledge that I'm here in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, also known uh, as Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Newfoundland. Uh, and I invite you, if you feel called, to maybe type in the chat where you're at so we get an idea who's in, in the room with us, in the proverbial larger room of us. I also want to just appreciate uh, my co-teacher, Starhawk, and the Earth Activist team that has, makes it possible for um, us to teach and been an inspiration in permaculture for over 20 years now. So I'm gonna just really appreciate Earth Activist training for making it possible for us to get together. And all of you, anybody who's lived in apartments, uh, people who are non-landed folks who have traveled uh, from wherever you have to live where you are, or maybe you've been the same place all your life. But for those who don't have land, I just want to appreciate all those people who, who live in apartments in small spaces and aren't living directly on or owning land. We're going to talk about that tonight. So first off, permaculture. What is permaculture? Uh, there's a number of different definitions. One that I really like is the one that Starhawk often uses. It's permaculture is a, as a system of ecological design. So it's a design system. Uh, that takes nature as our model. So we have a design, we look at nature, we try to model after nature because nature is brilliant and has been doing it for a long time. Um, and it, we're going to meet our human needs while we're generating the world around us. We're actually going to make the world better by our good design. So we're going to use good design, use ecological model to, to make a life for ourselves that is one that's resilient for both ourselves and the world around us. So I love that definition. I also really love Patrick Whitefield's definition. He says that permaculture is the art of designing beneficial relationships. And this one applies um, across the board in all contexts. But if you've ever lived in apartments, if you've ever lived in groups or small spaces, or you've had neighbors close by, the idea of having beneficial relationships with the things that we can engage with, um, I think speaks for itself. Like permaculture is like, how do we design so that we, we get benefit from all of our relationships? 
Um, permaculture originally started as a design system that focused on agriculture, permanent agriculture, uh, but it's really grown, you know, over the last decades. And now it's not just a design system, it's a social movement. So sometimes people say, you know, I'm doing permaculture and I'm a permaculturalist. And what they mean is that they're part of a movement of people who are ecologically focused, uh, creating regenerative culture, a culture that can sustain over time and, uh, and heal the planet. Um, sometimes people use the word just to say there were like-minded people who care about the earth, and care about the future, and care about people, and use permaculture as this catch-all, like we're just good people working on to make good ends meet here in the world. So, so permaculture can meet any of that. Um, I often talk about it as a design system, but there's times where you'll hear people use the term in different ways. And that People care, earth care, and future care I have here on the slide, that's the permaculture ethics. And if you come take a course with us, we'll talk more about what the ethics are in permaculture. But those are our founding ethics and guidance. So apartment permaculture. Um, there's a lot of principles that permaculture has. There's a, a number of different principles. People, you read different folks in permaculture, they talk about different principles. But one of the core founding tenets in permaculture is feed what you want to grow. And I think this works really well for um, where I live. You know, and I, you know, like I have limited space, but my space is super limited. So I really want to put my energy to feed that what I want to grow. If if I want it to be around, I want to put energy towards it. And if I don't want to have that, then I don't want to put energy towards it. So if you want to have food in your space, then you got to put the time and energy to do it. You got to dedicate some space to it, um, some some of the um, your life energy to it. And if there's things you don't want in your life, you don't want to feed it. Um, that goes in all sorts of realms, social and ecological is the same. So I have a few pictures of some of my systems that I'm using, and they almost all involve some stacking of functions. Um, some of it has vertical stacking where actually things are on top of each other, um, and almost everything has multiple functions. Um, and whenever we're designing in tight spaces, um, we're going to garden, or we're going to farm, or we're going to do anything, we're going to design for tight spaces, rarely do you want something that only does one thing. You want it to do a bunch of things or you want the space to be used really well. So, you know, in this case, I've got, um, uh, this was a couple of years ago where I, it was springtime and I was getting some starts going. So I have some uh, bins and beds where I have things that are just getting started, um, some greens and some herbs. I've got some plants that are gonna be going out into the garden later on. Um, I have, you know, I get a lot of light from a southwesterly window, which is awesome, uh, but I have to augment that light because I don't have enough light, you know, I don't have enough windows. So I add some growing lights and some heat, heat pads sometimes if it's, uh, if it's too cool to get seeds to germinate. So I'll often be stacking functions. That's one of the things you want to do in any tight space. Like how can you use the vertical space well, but also have things that are having a lot of different roles. Also, when I'm growing things, uh, I've moved from the intensive annual beds, which is a common way um, that, to grow food in small spaces, uh, flats of greens or starts or microgreens. And I still do some of those, but I've also moved to doing some polycultures. Poly, many cultures, a group of things. Um, so a polyculture would be a planting that um, has a number of different plants in the same pot or same bin. So I'll have like large potters, and inside, I might have an avocado or a lemon. Not that I'm getting avocados. I just think they're beautiful. Uh, underneath that, I might have a mango or a sage. You know, under, you know, in amongst that, I've got some agaves and prickly pears, um, um, cilantro, basil, tulsi. You know, I've got some ginger planted. It's really amazing. I don't know if you've ever grown ginger, but I planted it. And it comes up in the summertime when it's warm. It'll come up and it'll grow, be beautiful. I can cut it. I can use it in, in my cooking. And in the wintertime, it dies back and disappears. And then, you know, and summer comes back and the, the ginger comes back. Um, I grow a lot of gourds and peas and tomatoes that grow up in my windows. In the summertime, there's a lot of sunlight that comes in, but it also makes my house very hot. So I, I use the plants to do a lot of screening, um, to screen those windows, but it also gives me this really beautiful green light, um, keeps the house cool, um, <clears throat> gives a good, a lot of air cleaning um, capacity, having those plants in there and gives me some food. I plant some veggies in there. Um, I toss in some other things for diversity, like I have some bromeliads growing. Uh, so I try to have a variety of things growing all at once. Some of things are food and medicine, which I think is very valuable in the, the limited space. Um, and some of the things 
are like, I like to drink tea, so I have things to make tea with. Um, I have some things for uh, just the beauty of it. Like there's times I'll just grow some flower, you know, have flowers growing in there too. So a variety of things growing. You know, I want things flowering at different times. I like the flowers. I like different uh, foods coming in. I'm not getting a huge amount of production of, of things other than greens. I can get a lot of greens, but other than greens, not a lot of production, but a lot of beauty and a lot of engagement. Um, and for medicinal and teas, it works out for, and herbs. So I'm always trying to get a yield. I'm always trying to have, have my system yielding something. Not all of my things, not all of my planters are yielding at the same time but something is yielding always. So in the springtime, I'm trying to get starts. I'm going to get everything started and going. In the winter, I have a lot of greens going. And in summer, I don't grow as many greens because the farmer's markets are amazing. And there's so many good things growing outside that inside I have more of my perennials when I'm doing in the summers, but in the fall and winter and in spring when there's not as much going on outside, I'm growing more inside. So I'm really using my space to get things that are harder to get um, outside in the season or that when it's really easy to grow outside, I'll, I'll leave those things to be grown outside um, or farmer's markets. So I have a variety of things. I also shift up my systems. So, you know, sometimes I'll be growing a lot of uh, plants and other times I'm, I'm shifting that system around. Um, you know, this is my later summer, like same system, right? I just kind of shifted it a little bit. Uh, I've added a, a fish tank. So in the in the spring, late spring, early summer, I, I added a, um, an aquatic feature. So I, I start a fish tank. I bring a lot of things in from some of the local ponds because I have a young kid. I have a seven-year-old, important part of my design system, raising a kid. Uh, so we watch the aquatic ecosystem. That is the water I give to my plants. So as the water gets dirty, um, nutrient-rich, we call it dirty, but it's nutrient-rich, I use it to water my plants. It's really good for my plants. So you can see I've got this uh, water tank here. It waters my plants. It produces greens. It produces herbs for me down here underneath, but also in the tank has this incredible diversity. Um, part of uh, one of the things we can do in small spaces, uh, especially climate controlled spaces, is we can have a really high level of diversity. Um, diversity is really good for both production, but also for health. Like we can have, a, there's a lot of health benefits to having a diverse um, ecology around us. So I grew lots of things and the fish tank's great. It adds a lot of diversity, adds a lot of nutrients to my, my cycle for my plants. It's also like bingeable watching. Like instead of, you know, turning on Netflix, like I can watch, every, you know, the, the caddis flies and the damsel flies and the tadpoles and all those sorts of things kind of growing and living and changing in my tank. And, and yeah, it's fabulous. If you haven't lived with a, a really dynamic system, it's fabulous to live with. So um, I also, you can see underneath the tank down here, um, this is uh, our micro livestock, uh, reap and reap a sheep and peep a squeak, as they've been named by my son. Um, and they are an important part of our system, not just out of their pets, but they, they do a lot of things for us. Right? They're fairly easy keepers. Uh, we take them outside and they, they graze. I have, I wouldn't call it a postage stamp, outside my apartment that have very tiny, like incredibly tiny green space that nobody uses. It's kind of tucked between the building and some like propane tanks and a fence and like it's a dead end space, but it has grass and they mow it every once in a while. But I take the, the guinea pigs out there and they graze um, and I move them. So I do office work. I, I teach permaculture. I sit at my computer more than I'd like to. So I get up every few hours and I go outside and I move the, the the little grazer along the way you can see over here where they've been eating and over here where they aren't this is the sweet they're just moving along they eat <clears throat> so in summer it's really great they don't need as much food our little grazing keeping the grass down operation uh, and because i thought it was really ridiculous as i i do a walk i walk around the city i you know maybe you all get to walk around your cities but this is a lawn roomba uh, there's probably a more technical term for it but on one of the parks on a hilltop here in, Nova, in Halifax, they use a few of these, they have a fleet of these little like devices, the machines that, that prowl the top of the hillside and, grip, and mow all the grass all the time. They're always moving around, the little lawn Roombas. Um, so I really think they should get guinea pigs. But when I talked to them, they said that it wasn't historically accurate and they would need goats. Uh, but for some reason, lawn Roombas are historically accurate. So I don't know. Um, but my guinea pigs never fall over and get stuck. So I don't know. Uh, 
you know, we can do different things in our urban environment. So as we talk about kind of in the apartment permaculture, there's also kind of this urban landscape that we can think about different and start to engage with um, differently. And I think urban livestock are one of the areas that we can uh, be more um, uh, engaged in. Uh, and some of it could be, you know, sheep and goats, but also there's lots of other things in the grass that fit well within the city code. There's the codes that say you can't have things, but you can have pets, and there's almost no city that sees how many guinea pigs you want. But they produce waste, <clears throat> which is important in my system because I use it for, for fertilizer and for warm food, and I'll talk about those. But I just want to take a side note. Um, this little pie chart, I just pulled this up. Most cities, uh, this is from the province. This is so your state or province has, has a similar chart about waste, organic waste. Um, about half of it's usually food waste. Um, we need to do better. We need to produce less food waste. Uh, I feed some of my food waste to my worms, to my compost, to my guinea pigs. So I try to reduce that food waste. Uh, solid paper is a big waste that we have, a wa big waste stream in urban environments. The next big one, uh, unfortunately, it didn't show up as clear right now, is animal and pet waste. So that's somewhere between, usually between 10 and 20% um, for a state or a province. 10 or 20% of the organic waste in the waste stream is uh, pet waste. And sometimes they put diapers in there too, but it's like, that is a huge amount when you think about what it is. Like it's things that want to break down and we often need nutrients. So figuring out how to manage our, our pet waste. Uh, many of us as pets is a good question. Like, is there a way we can use it in our system? So I'm using, you know, mine. Uh, by gathering it up. I'm using a lot of it in my worm bin. So I'll put a bunch of it in the worm bin. I'll use some of it on just as like um, mulching around some of the plants. I save some of it for the small community garden pot I have. So it, some of it goes out for that. And there is some more that goes into the green bin um, and gets composted into the, the citywide compost. But I have a lot of different uses for it. So I do all these things that I want to, I need fertilizer for anyway before I put it out. So. Um, but worms, worms are one of these great things. Um, for an urban um, apartment compost system, especially if you don't access to outside, if you don't have a place you can do compost, and a lot of landlords don't want you to like compost in their space or they, you can't set them up or you have to find a neighbor or an abandoned lot or something you can use. But worms you can do in your space. You know, it's a tub, it's a tote, you keep your worms in it, you feed them, they can rapidly um, eat a lot of food. They can rapidly eat a lot of vegetable matter and turn it into worm castings. And worm castings are great for your plants. Um, um, they're in incredibly nutrient dense. They also have a lot of microbes in it that are uh, beneficial microbes in it. And if you do it well, you can process a lot of uh, food waste and make a lot of worm castings that you can use on your plants, or you can save it up and then use it if you have a community garden plot and you're going to plant out in the spring, you save it all winter, and then in the springtime, you have something to, to kind of kickstart your garden with. So a really easy way to, to, to do composting inside. Um, it's, and if you do it right, it's not smelly and it's not buggy. Um, you do it wrong and it can be smelly and buggy, but we can talk, we talk more about that in our permaculture courses, about how you do it. So worm bins are great. They're also, uh, I will take the worm bins and before I you know, separate the worms and take the castings, for, like, well, often me and my kid will mix them up with water and we'll look at it, see what's in there. You know, we'll pull out the microscope. It's something to go, do on a weekend morning. So, so all of these things that I do um, have a teaching component, partly because I'm a teacher, but also because I'm curious. So you know, we can almost all these, as I talk about, there's so many activities you can do with them all. Yeah, especially if you have kids around. So it's part of my design. My apartment design is everything around kids. So once I have worm castings, so, so basically, you know, I'm growing plants. I feed some of the plants to my guinea pigs. Um, I have some fish that I use the water to water plants, you know, the waste from the guinea pigs and waste from the plants and from my food preparation um, go to worm bin. That worm bin then becomes potting soil. Um, and I use potting soil mostly in the spring. I don't do a lot of potting other times of the year. Sometimes I'll have other flats of things I'm doing, uh, but the bulk of it I'm using in the spring. So I, I'll take my worm bin and I'll mix my worm castings. I, I'll divide out the worms and I'll mix it with equal parts perlite, which is that white, those like light, light white kind of, they're not styrofoam. Some people look, say they look like styrofoam balls in, the, in potting soil and coconut coir, which is coconut husk. So I'll mix it one 
equal parts of the three of those, mix it up, and that's what I make my potting soil out. It makes a really great, easy potting soil um, that I then use to replant my pots because my plants get bigger, so I have to put them in bigger pots if they're perennials, and for my annual starts or flats of greens, um, this is what I use for that, or if I'm doing propagation. So I'll make, I'll make my potting soil, and from that potting soil is when I'll, what I'll plant my seeds into. Um, and I have a really good germination rate. The worm castings do a really good job of holding moisture with the coir and having enough nutrients. Uh, it makes a really good potting soil. It's also really good for propagation. And propagation is uh, of cuttings, that type of propagation, where you cut off um, parts of plants, um, perennials, woody plants, and you stick them in the ground, they'll root. In the springtime, there's a lot of things that'll, that'll do hardwood cuttings. So just as before it starts leafing out or just as leafing out is a good time to cut and you can make a lot more plants. So I often will do a lot of uh, hardwood cuttings. Um, in the spring, there's some fall cuttings that you can do um, and to make more plants. I don't have a place to put a lot of these plants, but I love growing plants. So I'll give them away um, or I'll sell them, but mostly I just give them away. I'll start lots of plants and people always want plants. So you always can be making plants, dividing up plants. Uh, root division, this is when you, if you've ever had something with like a big tuber or something and as it grows, it divides. Um, um, lilies will do this or a garlic will do, you know, things with tubers that'll, um, that'll grow and divide themselves, you can divide those up. So um, this potting soil works really good for division if you're gonna divide things out and start them to grow in small pots or cut up the roots of things that like to um, be cut into small pieces and grow off small root stems. And then there's layering, which is another process that you can use this for, which is where you bend a branch down. There's some plants when a, when a branch touches the ground, it'll put roots where it touches the ground. Um, and I'll do that with some of my perennials, like my sages and, and thymes and things like that. You can layer as a way in which to make more plants. So even inside, you can be making more plants. It can be a little cottage industry, or it can just be a nice gift for friends. Um, my advice when you grow things inside, um, is to grow something you love and, and something that you want to use, something that you like. Like I like mint and I like Tulsi, so I grow a lot of it. You know, I like herbs, I like cilantro, I like thyme, and I like basil, so I'll grow a lot of it. I don't grow the things I don't eat. There's a limited amount of space. Um, or I'll grow things that are just beautiful and that grow really well. So those are the two um, kind of categories. Grow well and easy because they're beautiful, or they um, have a really... A lot of use for them, use a lot of utility, and that's all grown my place, my space, <clears throat> because I have limited windows. So uh, the light space is really limited. So using um, lamps help, but natural light is by far the best. So I want to use that really well. So I'll pot them up again. So this is that that cycle that I talked about. So you know, then I'll get my plants growing again, and my plants will then feed, help feed my guinea pigs. They'll feed me my food scraps you know, go back into the warm bin and around we go. Another thing that I like to cultivate while I'm uh, in my space is mushrooms. Um, mushrooms are another easy thing that you can do in an apartment setting. So um, the mushrooms are much like us. They're, they're much more closely related to animals than plants. Mushrooms, they breathe like we breathe. They like the temperatures we like. They like generally, um, uh, environment that's not completely dark. They actually like these partial shade, partial sun um, spaces, kind of like the modeled forest. And of course, where I live, it's not full sun all the time. I only get sun when it comes in the window. So I have a lot of like partially sunny, partially shady spaces, uh, like counters and, um, you know, the floor around different spaces. Like I have a lot of places that I can grow mushrooms. So this is an example. This mushroom is an oyster mushroom that I'm growing in a mason jar. I'm using coffee grounds, very local. They come from my counter where my coffee setup is. So I'll take coffee grounds. And if I need more, I'll go to a local coffee shop to get more. But I'll get coffee grounds and I'll mix them with the local mushrooms I get from a local uh, mushroom grower. They'll give me mushroom spawn, sell me mushroom spawn, put it in a, a mason jar. There's a little technique to it, but they're very friendly and very easy to grow. And you can grow them in any season. So growing uh, mushrooms. Here's uh, the mushrooms. Not in a little mason jar. This is in a five-gallon bucket. So this is just a larger system, um, and this is in the same room the other one was, just in a different spot in the room, and it's growing well. So I was getting a lot of these oyster mushrooms. Very easy to grow. They produce quite a bit. 
Um, and you can cut them up and you know put them in your pasta sauce or saute them straight. I like to dry them often. I'll cut them up and I'll dry them and then I'll grind them into a powder and sprinkle them on like popcorn and put them in soup. They're really good in soup stock. So mushrooms, really easy to grow mushrooms inside. Um, a little bit of tending, but the amount that you produce is high. The investment can be low for the amount they produce. So once you get food, you're starting to produce food inside. Greens are really easy. You can eat them straight. There's thin things you want to cook. So uh, one permaculture approach to cooking is to kind of move away from these high energy systems. We have a climate issue that it comes from how we produce our electricity. You know, coal fired, oil fired. We have a lot of energy production that we need to figure out how to reduce our energy use. And hay boxes are a great way to do it. So a hay box comes, historically, it was like a box full of hay. That's what the term comes from. It's basically an insulated box. And that's what you can see here. I've made an insulated box. Um, and when, we, when you cook something on the stove, think of you're cooking um, a soup or you're cooking uh, oats or you're cooking, you know, you're going to cook something or a crock pot, like something that you put on the stove and you turn the heat on to get it up to temperature and then you turn it down to simmer it for a while. Like the reason why we leave the stove on is that we need to keep adding heat because our pot, if we turn it off, would just cool down, right? It wouldn't cook anymore. But what would happen if you were able to heat the pot up so it was boiling and then not let it cool down? You wouldn't need to add any more heat. You wouldn't have to keep your stove on. So that's what a hay box does. I heat my pot of soup up or my pot of pozole or stew or whatever I want to cook. And so it gets to cooking temperature. And then I take it and I put this in a super insulated box and I put the lid on. And it doesn't cool off. So it keeps cooking, you know? four, six, eight, 12, 24 hours later, I can pull it out and it's still hot. Um, so it's like a crock pot, but you don't have to plug it in and use that energy all the time. You can just put it in here, put the lid on and leave it. Um, my hay box rarely looks at this, like this hay box in the middle. It looks like, oh, there's my hay box and I can take the lid off. It's rarely, it's, oh, it's a coffee table. It's just like, there's things on it all the time. And when I wanna um, use it for cooking, I clear off the things. I put my pot in there and then my, you know, the book I'm reading goes back on top of my coffee cup and my, you know, you know, plate and my, you know, my kids toys, they all go back on that. And when I need to check it, I just move them off and I can open up again because, you know, six or eight hours, it works fine as a coffee table. So a hay box is a really great way to decrease your energy demand in your house. If you're trying to decrease your, your bills, like how much you're paying for electricity, this is one of the things you can do if you want to decrease your ecological footprint. Um, hay boxes are a great way. Um, you make them and then you just keep putting things in them. They're really good for, for cooking, as I said, soups and stews and you know, things that need to cook for a length of time. They're really good for cooking things like um, oats. So if you like oats in the morning, it's great. You put them in at night and they're ready in the morning. Um, and you can do it for like culturing yogurt if you make yogurt. The other amazing things about a hay box, if you've ever had the problem of putting something on the stove and you're like, I'm going to get back to it, I'm turning it down. You turn it down, you leave it, and then you forgot, and you come back and it burnt on the bottom. Hay boxes never do this because once you bring it up, temperature is heating, you know, it's hot. It's, and you put it in the hay box because you're not adding any heat, you don't burn anything. So it just cools down very, very, very slowly. But since you're not adding heat, you're not going to burn anything, which is really great. So you could like put your oats in there, get up to temperature, put them in your hay box, put the lid on, go to bed, and it's not going to have them burnt in the morning. Um, it'll be perfectly cooked and ready to go. So big call out for hay boxes. So another system, right? So we're thinking of these systems we can do in urban, um, in apartment, small spaces. You know? And I said, they can have a lot of functions. Mine's a blackboard, it's a coffee table, it's a hay box. Everything has to do a number of things. Uh, the last part thing I would just wanna to touch on quickly is drapes, curtains. Um, and it might not sound exciting to you, but curtains are exciting to me. I like curtains. Um, I like sunlight in, but I also like to, similar to the hay box, where if we could heat up our houses so that they're warm and then not let the heat escape, we wouldn't have to continue to heat them. We wouldn't need such an enormous heating bill. So one of the areas that houses leak are the windows and the doors. So if you think of a house like a bucket um, with a hole in it, and the hole is like the window, that's where the most of the, the water comes out of a bucket with a hole in it, but most of the heat comes out of our houses. It doesn't matter how nice of a bucket you have. If you have a really leaky hole in the bucket, it'll leak. And the same is true with your house. You can have amazing insulated walls and amazing insulated roof. And if you have a really leaky window, that's where all your heat's going, right? And you know this because you can feel it, you know, coming off a window in the winter if you live in cold climates. So those windows are where you get a lot of heat. Leaving in the winter 
in cold climates, but you also get a lot of heat coming in in the summer or during hot days. So addressing those windows. Um, and this, is the, this chart was a, a study done in Australia where they looked at single glazed window. Glaze is glass, so it had single plane of glass. Um, and new value is like how much it lets heat go through in 6.9. But if you had a really nice window, like the top one, double glazed, you know, low E argon pill, like fancy window, good window, uh, they only have um, a 2.8, almost a three. So it's like twice as efficient as a single glaze. It's, you know, much better to have these double glazed windows. But if you live in an apartment like I do, I can't change the windows out. I can't convince my landlord to change the windows out. Like they're what they are, right? But I can put up drapes. And by putting a good heavy drape on with a palmette, which is kind of the top, um, you can see that over here in this this one. It's a solid piece, so that air, um, let's say there's cold air in the window, it, it can't come out, it can't escape out here. Hot air can't come in, cold air can't come through the top. So it's not an open top, it's a closed top. So you don't get a draft coming up and down the window. So if you have a solid top and a drape that either goes all the way down to the ground or it touches very solidly against the wall, so you can't get a draft going up past the window. Um, you can really reduce the amount of energy that you lose out of your windows just by having a good, uh, a good curtain. Um, and you don't keep it closed all the time. Of course, you open it when it's sunny out or during nice days. You close it at night when you're sleeping, you know, when you don't need it open. You open and close it, and it can save you a lot of energy. So that's another thing. You can do a very simple thing in, a, in an apartment. And I've started making drapes um, that have a lining of... Um, uh, kind of reflective. It's kind of like that stuff uh, inside of a potato chip bag that's shiny mylar. You can go to a, a, a camping store and get these emergency blankets. You put around yourself in case you uh, get stranded somewhere and you need a. And it's like it's like a big piece of foil, uh, a little more durable than that. But I'll sew them inside the curtains, and they make them way more efficient too. They they make uh, the it's harder for the heat to come through. It reflects the heat uh, back into the room and back outside the space. So it works really well. So you can like make some really nice curtains and sew a little bit of uh, these emergency blankets in it and make it a really a much more efficient curtain, even more efficient than these numbers. So we could do that to make our spaces more efficient and regulate the temperature, which is often important. You know, I live on the fourth floor, so I get all the heat from everybody below me, but the people down below are colder. So you know, regulating the temperature becomes really an important part of my, my seasonal activity. So Apartment. Um, this is a quick few ways that I do it, and then we're going to break for some questions. But just to remember, feed what you want to grow. So think about what you want in your life, whatever it is. Uh, you might want more greens. You might want more mushrooms. You might want uh, to have more life in your apartment. You might want, you know, uh, uh, a partner who is amazing, you know, whatever. You know, feed what you want to grow, you know, in your apartment. Like, create the spaces you want. It'll come, right? Um, have diversity, increase the diversity in your spaces. We often in our urban spaces, you know, especially in our indoor spaces, don't have a lot of diversity. So how can we increase that diversity? And with diversity comes more life um, and comes more options. And so I'd increase the diversity you have. Think in cycles. Is there any way you can link together the systems you already have? Like, oh, where are you, and where are you missing a link in that system? Is there anything you can do to link it in? And the answer might be no, and the answer might be yes, but start to think about it. Like, what could you do to link in? And then expand your thinking from your own apartment to your neighbors, because there's something that maybe collectively you can do in your building or you know, in lots that are nearby or things that are on your block or things that are across the street. Like, what are the systems and the cycles that you have and how can you link them up? And how can you keep them as close as possible to where you live? Uh, building the beneficial relationships that often is inside your space, but also in, in the neighborhood around. Um, plant seeds. I encourage you all to plant some seeds, find something you love to grow and try to grow it. If you're not a good gardener, not a good grower, plant it anyway and try. Um, see what you can get to grow. Um, you'll find your affinity to some plants will be greater than others and that's fine. Find the things you love, find the things that love to grow with you. Um, uh, grow food and also grow medicine. Um, grow things that, that make you healthier. Um, and they might just make you happy, which is a, is a piece of medicine, but also there are things, you know, like I grow aloe because have fair skin um, sun and we go out and outside and we get suntan and sunburn. You gotta deal with that. So to grow the medicine that you need. Um, incorporate animals if you can. And I don't just mean like mammals and chickens and stuff, but like what other living things work well in your space? 
Maybe they're worms. Maybe, maybe they're birds. You know, whatever it is. Think about what animals might be in your system and around your system uh, that can help. Uh, reduce energy use when you can. Think about where you lose the most energy, and that energy can be lost in the rain. Uh, heat could be light, could be in money. Like where they're they're really big draws, and there are there ways to reduce the loss of them. And have fun because it's fun to live in apartments. And I'll come back to that. We have a we have a couple of trainings coming up, so I'm going to pitch it now. I'll, I'll put the slide back on later. We have two courses coming up: a permaculture design course, which is a 72 hour. It's 14 weeks. We're going to go depth in all of this stuff. And then we entered a permaculture, which is basically just the first few weeks, first three weeks of that. Um, that course, we want to just try it out to get an introduction to what permaculture is. And we're running a special tonight um, and, and for the weekend. Uh, we have a promo code so you can get 20% um, off if you sign up now for either of these courses. And we'll talk more about um, permaculture and them. But I've got some more time, so I'm going to move on and um, see if I, there's some questions and conversation we can have about living in urban spaces. So give me one moment because you put a lot in the chat and I've got to scroll through it. Uh, or if somebody wants to un raise their hand, there's a little emoji in the bottom somewhere that says reactions and you can like raise your hand or you can just unmic and say, I have a question. And uh, let me talk through some of this. So if there's any questions, feel free to raise your hand or if there's a topic you want me to talk more on. Charles, the first question started with uh, Patricia Scott at 723, which is asking about potting soil. Do you um, do equal parts by weight or equal parts by volume? Oh, equal parts by volume. Mm -hmm. One okay. cup of this, one cup of that, one cup of this. Mix it up. And that was the first question of where it started. Do you want me to read to you the second question or you're going to scroll? Uh, go ahead if you've got it already. Um. <clears throat> Yes, the next question was about what was the insulation on the inside of the hay box? Oh, you can use lots of things to insulate the inside of a hay box. So as I said, hay was originally it. Um, I've used old construction foam. So this is a uh, cast off from an old a, a local construction project. They're just throwing it away. Uh, I know people who've made uh, boxes and they just use old blankets and towels. Think about anything that's in, like if you would put it on uh, to stay warm in the wintertime, you could use it. Uh, since your pot isn't leaking in there, you know, it's, it's, a, it's contained. Anything that's insulative will work, but I used foam. I used construction foam. I just cut it and slid it in there and then kind of taped over the top so that it, it wouldn't slide out. Next questions from Anna, how do I keep my indoor cats away and bugs? I have a lot of natural light, northeastern exposure on the Lower East Side of New York City. Okay, cats, cats can be tricky. Um, and there are lots of cat owners out here. I don't have a cat, so I only speak a little bit to that, but if anybody wants to toss in what their tricks are for cats. Um, so, you know, cats love spaces. They, they love particular things. So if, they, if they're eating their plants, I would choose different plants um, or move them places they couldn't access. And why are they trying to get there? Are they trying to get there for heat? Are they trying to get there um, because there's not a better place to do whatever they're looking for? Like, do they want to lay down? Are they looking for litter? You know, what is it they're trying to do? And can you make a better place for that activity? Um, um, and as for bugs, uh, I don't generally have a problem with bugs because of the diversity of things I have. So I have a lot of different things growing. I don't have a lot of bug issues. Uh, there are different seasons where I get bugs. So there's sometimes there's spiders coming in because it's the spider season, but then they go away. Um, there's sometimes there's fruit flies, um, especially if they're, um, if I've been you know, processing a lot of things uh, in my kitchen. Uh, but as soon as I kind of remove the food source away, the bugs seem to really die down. So I haven't really had a big problem with bugs, but if there's particular bugs you're talking about, um, uh, because I know different bu buildings in different regions have different bugs that are really common, um, that we could talk about individual bugs that you have. But I don't really have a lot of bugs and I haven't ever in any of my living spaces. Okay, another question would be from Stella Rue. 
when you want to use the worm castings for potting soil, or do you need to remove the worms? I would think we need to talk, take worms out to keep, um, yeah, that's where it ends. So. Yeah, so generally for worms, when I have my worm bin, um, I will sort out the worms. So I'll remove the worms before I use the cast. Though I'm not, uh, if I'm using it for potting soil in little pots, I try to do a really good job of sorting them out. So I'll, I'll spend some time sorting them out. There's easy ways to do this where you um, can take the, the castings and kind of spread them out and the worms will seek to hide in dark places. So if you spread it thin and make a few piles, they'll actually like climb into where the piles are. Like you'll make a pile of worm castings and then spread the rest of it thin and they'll, they'll find the place that's dark. Um, or you put it in a bowl and you kind of scrape off the top layer and you harvest some of those castings and the worms will move down to the bottom because they don't like the light and take the next layer off. Um, so that's how you can kind of sort it. The other way is put all the food you put in your worm bin on one end and all the worms will go there, eat it, and you harvest off the other end. And then put all the food on the other end and they'll all go over there and then you harvest the, the end that they're not on. So you, by moving their food around, you can get the worms to fairly self-sort, but you do self-sort them. If I'm using them for my garden, like outside garden for say planting or top dressing or um, uh, for some larger pots, I won't be as fastidious because I don't mind if some worms get into my garden. I don't mind if some worms are in my larger pots, but my little pots, I try to do a pretty good job of sorting. I also want to acknowledge that Patricia Scott gave a really great recommendation about using a cardboard as insulation between the windows and the blinds and how that could really be um, a good mm -hmm. resource to use that's you know, easy to get. Oh, there's a question about watering I see now. Um, I'm not sure if I'm jumping ahead or not. Nope, uh, you're right on track. That was yeah. the next question. So watering, um, if you can get on watering, can I have a schedule that helps? Uh, uh, but if you can't, if you have one of these lives where this like regular watering is not possible for any number of reasons, there are some self-watering um, beds where you actually have your bed, basically it's a two part container. The top part is where you put all your stuff that's gonna grow. And then the bottom is sort of water and you can water in there and um, have usually it's pieces of cloth that are going down into the water and it sucks it up. The, what I usually do instead of making these more complex systems, and you can find a few designs online, uh, but what I usually do is just make bigger containers. So if I am wanting not to water as much, I will just make bigger containers. If you have very small containers and very thin flats, they dry out really fast. So you have to be on it and watering them all the time because they're always drying out. Um, but in like some of my pictures, you'll see that I had like these larger um, kind of white half barrels or half 35 gallon drums. It's because I wanted to grow some larger plants, but I didn't want to water as much. And I go away. I go teaching for two weeks at a time. And, you know, my plants have to survive for two weeks with no water. So I water them heavy. And, and the way that works is having a large enough um, container that your plants are in. So if you're going to water them less, have a bigger container. Um, or have a two-stage container where you have the potting soil and the, the plants in a, the shallower tray. And then underneath that, you have a water tray and you'll have cloth that runs from the upper tray into the lower tray. And the cloth will actually suck the water up into the, the top tray. So there's some ways that you can do that um, to, to have some automatic watering. Um, there's also like automatic watering systems, which is like drip systems. Um, not usually used inside, but you can use them inside. And you put them on a timer and they just turn on. And when the timer comes on, they water your stuff and turn off. Why not? You just have to watch them because sometimes they forget to turn on, like power goes off or something gets clogged. So you just, you also want to watch them just to make sure they don't forget to cycle on or something goes wrong for a few weeks. Mm, there's a question about what animal waste can go in a worm bin. So animals that eat only vegetables can go in the worm bin. Animals that eat meat, you probably don't want to put in your worm bin. So cats and dogs, though you could read what's in their, their um, packaging, um, they evolutionarily eat meat. So you want to put their waste in a compost bin 
or in a green bin. You don't want to put them in your worm bin. Uh, but if you have completely herbivore animals, that's where my guinea pigs come in, is that can go in the worm bin. That, that's fine. But if, if they have evolved to eat meat and their digestive system works in that way, um, you want to avoid putting that in the worm bin for two reasons. One is they're probably going to, the volume is going to overmax your bin. And the other reason is the pathogens that exist in things that eat meat um, can transfer. There's more of them that can transfer between humans and um, uh, animals and humans because we, our biology is much more similar. Like our biology is not very similar to a uh, razor. Like the pathogens that live in the guts of that are not ones that are the ones that are most dangerous to us. The ones that are, are the ones that live and the ones that have a similar biology to us. So those are the ones that can evolve and have evolved to eat meat. So those we want to put in the compost system that gets hot enough that it'll actually kill those pathogens. Uh, question about what else can you use if you don't have worm bins? Uh, you can use good compost. Worm casting is better than compost and it has a, a larger variety of microorganisms and is digested um, uh, in a way that makes it a little more accessible to plants. Um, so I like worm castings, but really good compost works fine for, for um, potting soil. And when I say really good compost, it's something that's broken down really well. Um, if it's for seeds or propagation, like for that, I like to use pot, um, compost that has been hot compost, the thermophilic. They have gotten into a hot cycle. Um, so it's killed off any dangerous bacteria and is, is coming in somewhat cleaner uh, because some of the cold composts, the compost that kind of just milder along, some of those black barrel systems, you can pick up some other pathogens that um, can be hard on your seeds. And sometimes that'll reduce your germination rate. Um, so if you're trying to keep a high germination rate, having a really good compost that came from a hot composting system uh, will make a difference. Uh, Allison was asking about the grow lights. I have them on timers. I have them turn on and off. And I adjust the timer slightly depending on what plants I'm growing and what season it's in. Um, so if it's in the summertime, when I get a lot of natural light in my windows, I will have the lights on much less. In the winter time, when I'm getting seeds started, I'll have them on longer and I cycle them um, at about a six hour cycle. So they're not on all day and they're not on all night. They're, all, they're off all night. Um, yeah, but in this, even in the daytime, I don't have them on all day. I cycle them off and cycle them on um, my lights. So I, I put them on timers. And depending on the plants, um, some of the perennials I'll have them on slightly longer. Um, some of the annuals on, and it depends on what window they're around. So. Uh, so I'm coming through. If my third floor apartment overheats in the winter, oh, I have this problem. Uh, yeah, so the design of apartments is a is horrible in this way that like the people at the bottom crank their heat because it's cold and the people at the top get roasted to open the window and then you have this chimney where you basically suck all the hot air and you blow it outside and they're super inefficient. Um, really frustrating to me that it's such poorly designed. It would just take a little bit of ventilation um, planning and you, we, they could solve this problem in buildings. But um, so I do the same thing. I turn the heat down um, and then I open and close doors. Um, so also using the doors in my, my spaces to keep areas warmer or colder. So, and in higher, when you get up into taller buildings, um, you can isolate uh, because not all the venting is coming equally in all of your rooms. You'll notice this, like some rooms um, you're getting more of the heat than other rooms. It's because of how the holes from bottom to underneath uh, are coming up. So you'll get more things in from your door and more things in where a lot of pipes are coming. So um, often in the bathrooms, in the kitchens, and where you have more piping coming, you're getting more of the heat coming in those spaces. Uh, so I often will use the doors to regulate the temperature in my space. So I don't have to open the window as much to try to regulate the spaces. Uh, but without any cycling, any like fans that move it between your, your apartment and like something else down below, you have very little options. 
<laughs> or work with your neighbors, which can be um, a challenge, especially if they don't feel like they have any control either because they're down below and it's just cold. Uh, uh, and we need to do something with our building code just about heating of buildings. Um, they're just poorly designed. So there's a couple of things that eventually, hopefully, will be addressed by the building code. Some is around um, how how ventilation works between spaces, and a lot of it's like fire breaks we're trying to do. But also, just we have bad design. You know, there's buildings. I've been watching buildings going up around me all the time. They're, this city is exploding with buildings. Right, a lot, a lot of apartments going up, and they they make these concrete buildings. <clears throat> you watch them they come up. They put their they pour concrete slabs that make the floors. And then they have almost all of them have balconies these days that stick out. So you have this concrete pad that goes and it sticks outside of the building where the, the balcony is going to be. And then they put the walls up. So every building has a, a concrete floor that sticks out as fins, like big fins that stick out into the outdoors. So in the wintertime, when they're trying to heat it, all of the floors have big concrete things sticking out. So they're freezing outside. And that's why you never get much snow piling up on concrete balconies is that the inside is trying to heat the outside. So they're actually forcing the buildings to use a lot more heat to try to heat these patios that nobody are on in the wintertime because they, they didn't divide them out. So we just need different buildings. Um, let's see. There's a question about what's the name of the watering systems I was talking about, the self-watering ones. Um, just look up self-watering um, planters self-watering planters, you should find some designs. I don't have one on hand right now that I can offer you, but self-watering planters, there's a number of different designs out there. Um, some things about permaculture course, wicking planters. Thank you, Stella, that's another way. Okay, are there any other questions? I'm gonna turn off the speaker view and looking at myself a lot, and I'm gonna let you all, so we all see each other. Um, and if we can make this so we can see everybody. And are there other questions or other things you'd like to talk more about? I think I got the ones in the chat. I just wanted to say thank you for answering my question. This is Patricia. I was typing when someone was answering and I couldn't find the place to, to thank. So oh, <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm inspired by apartment living. I, um, you know, originally I lived out in rural spaces, lots of land. I was like, I know permaculture is for that, but moving in is really forced me to be very creative in the use of space. And I'm sure you all have ways that you use your space creatively. I hope you share the techniques that you found. But some of the things that I found that really work well is this whole stacking, really trying to figure out how I can link together my systems, what it is that I need, and how I can link together my systems to help me get my needs met um, in such a small space. Oh, Kathy has a really great question about how do you balance the time caring for your apartment system and doing your day job? So for me, what I do is I try to make simple systems that have a lot of self-management. As I said, I leave, I teach. So I'm, I work at home, which is great. I can do things at home. But then I leave for two weeks at a time. So my systems have to be able to take care of themselves. Um, with the exception of my guinea pigs, which really need somebody to feed them and move them, all the rest of it will take care of itself. My fish tank will take care of itself. My plants, um, you know, the things I'm growing, they'll, they'll take care of themselves because I've made my pots big enough. I've actually made them larger so they can do that. I've used timers in a really creative way. So, so my electrical timers, they are really important in my system because they'll turn lights on and off. They'll turn pumps on and off. They'll turn a lot of my system on and off. Um, and then I take full advantage of my windows and. Um, when I was deciding what apartment I wanted to be in, I did look carefully to have windows, both windows on a number of different sides. So I tried to have windows on more than one side, but also that were south, um, generally south facing, which gave me a lot more options than if I had just north facing windows. Um, and so 
really trying to create and harness the things that were uh, that were unknown. Like there's some things that were really unique in my situation. Like I've realized that in the summertime, spring and summertime, all the wind comes from one side. So I can have all the wind windows on the other side of my house open all the time and water never comes in, like rain never comes in. And then as the season moves, it shifts the other way. Like I can open these ones, but these have to stay closed. So I can, I've really figured out how to work with the weather. So even when I'm gone, I'm like, I know this is safe to open this window for ventilation or this one has to stay closed because of how the storms and the winds work. Um, and they're very reliable because there's some ways they blow and some ways they don't kind of where the eaves and how the microclimates work. So really observing to see what part of the natural system I can really work with and, and have my be my ally in trying to either vent light or heat or cool or whatever I need. Uh, somebody asked, do I use Super Thrive? I don't know what that is, so no. There a question about balconies where the winters are really severe. If you mean like growing things on the balconies, I would plan to move them in and out. Like if you have really severe winters, balconies are super exposed. Um, I think there's things you can do uh, with structure of the balconies to use them well, but I would use them as a summer space um, and maybe use them in the wintertime on, on nice days, unless you can enclose them or in some ways like shelter in them. Um, I've seen some really great permaculture designs for balconies in tropics and subtropics. Uh, but for really cold spaces, mostly people are abandoning them or only using them on nice days and moving everything inside. And let's, let's see. Do you collect other? Oh, um... oh great. Josie, about um, collecting water. Yeah. It's collecting water, like in the shower, um, trying to collect extra water, like, or when you're running the sink. Uh, collect extra water like when you're trying to wait for things to heat up or cool down yeah, i do collect the water and use that um, since i live in a place that chlorinates water i'll often collect that extra water and then i let it sit a little bit to let the, the chlorine leave and then i put that water into i take water out of my fish tank to water my plants and then the water i collect i put into my fish tank or i can just water directly my plants but i usually put them through my tank first to try to get more nutrients in the water before I water with them. But yeah, I do collect um, from sources. Um, though I also have a, a, a young, young child, which makes all of this a little suspect at moments because they, they are really good about helping the system and sometimes they, they undermine my system and dump my things out and <laughs> do other fun things. So it's a good learning, um, not to take it all too seriously, but have fun with it. Uh, so somebody, Evelyn, was asking about cucumbers, uh, growing cucumbers inside. Um, so when a lot of plants that grow inside, you'll find flower really well, but they don't produce much fruit. And it has a lot to do with pollinators. Like you don't have a lot of bees in your house. Uh, you don't have a lot of like flying things that are like, and you don't even have a lot of wind usually that blowing the pollen around. So I have a paintbrush. I have a few of them actually. I have a few paintbrushes, one for each plant. But I have paintbrushes and we paint the flower, like every flowers, and they're gendered. So on cucumbers, they're gendered, just boy flowers and girl flowers. So you have to take the boy flowers and paint, you know, waggle them, and then you waggle the girl flowers. And so you that's an easy way to get better germination. So if you're finding that you're getting a lot of flowers and not many, um, not much fruit, try hand pollinating. And that's true for tomatoes, it's true for um, the squashes and the cucumbers and the gourds and like there's um, that can do a, can help a lot and be able to get a little more production by actually cross pollinating yourself. It's a fun activity, um, and but um, and also um, knowing you know keeping track of your pollen, especially if you have things that will cross breed. If you want to have anything that's that has true seed, but you know just paint painting them. That's easiest way to get more. Um, if the temperature, I've been finding, though I haven't found good in literature that talks about this, but if it gets too hot, I find that 
you get more of one gender flowers usually the males and the females in the cucumbers, but I don't know if that's just my experience or if there's actually true science behind that. So I try to, um, in the spring and the fall where the temperatures are a little more mild, I get a lot more um, ability to make fruit than in the middle of the summer where it's really hot. Oh, do you want to see that last slide? As soon as I can see that last. Uh, I'll show that last slide because there's a, it has our code on it. There uh, we go. There we go. So the Earth Actors training, we have these two courses coming up. The permaculture design course, which is a full um, certificate course, 14 weeks. Uh, promo code, if you go to earthactivisttraining.org, permaculture design certificate, fall 2023, um, and you put in the promo code PDC23, uh, you can have 20% off if you register um, this weekend before Monday. Uh, introduction to permaculture, which is a short course. It's the first three, day, three weeks of the full course. Um, if you just want to get an introduction to it, um, you can have the same 20% off if you go and register now, earthactivisttraining.org, Introduction to Permaculture. They start September 7th or 10th, and the full course goes to the 17th, and the introduction goes to the 24th. So at that, we've come to our hour. Thank you everybody for coming. We'll be sending out a link to this so you can rewatch the video or check out the slides. The should have the video out in the next day or two. It takes a little time to upload, but once it's uploaded and ready, we'll send it up to you. Thank you, Charles. Have a great night. Thanks for coming. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.